Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we are continuing our series of um, looking at the way that SolarWinds can be customised and today we're looking at API integrations. And I also have with me today uh, my colleague, uh, Senior Monitoring Engineer here and Developer, uh, Antonis. Good morning, Antonis. Good morning, everyone. So um, let's crack on. Um, we're going to start off on a slide deck uh, to begin with, just to kind of set the foundation. Um, the importance of what we want to uh, achieve today is to get across how uh, SolarWinds Orion can be extended. Uh, we'll see how we can uh, integrate this solution with a number of third-party platforms, how we can automate things, um, basically how we can be intelligent and, and be a bit more advanced in how we are utilizing the platform. Uh, in terms of what we want to do today, as I say, we're going to start off on the PowerPoint, uh, but we will, uh, are going to be showing you uh, live demonstrations. So uh, we are going to be praying to the um, demo gods, uh, making sure that everything works. Uh, but hopefully from this, you'll be able to see um, two examples of how we can leverage, um, in this case, on the demo today service now to act, uh, interact with the platform to perform functionality which does not need any human interaction. And at the end, we will uh, make some good time uh, for question and answers. Uh, we know when we've had these kind of discussions previously uh, that this is an interest area and obviously it's a, a little bit more uh, complicated. So let's have a look. Uh, we are going to just um, start off on a, a quick poll uh, just so we can get an understanding of where you guys are, whether you're using uh, the API, kind of how advanced it is. So uh, we're just going to open up the poll now and just request that you um, submit some of your questions. Okay, so we've got some votes coming in. So far, we're seeing that most people are not using the API functionality at all or doing any kind of integration. And uh, actually, a good number. We've got uh, a good number of people here. Um, so uh, hopefully you can see on your screen now uh, that we've got 49% uh, of you are not using the API, uh, but a good 30%. And this is really good to see that uh, you have some integrations in place already. Uh, so from that point of view, maybe you're doing things that are in line with what we're going to be talking about today. Um, it's always useful and always good and interesting for us to see um, the inventive ways that people utilize uh, the API for their environments. Okay, so uh, from here, we're going to come back to the slide deck. And so if, here we have uh, some reasons for automation. Now, uh, DevOps uh, clearly is an area of um, a key interest at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of um, users uh, taking that approach uh, where we have uh, different people getting involved. We've got um, the operational teams uh, actively getting involved in automating, in performing integrations between systems uh, for their benefit. Now, this is always one of those things where um, the value um, compared to the time and effort to put these in place uh, needs to be identified and determined. Uh, but from our point of view, uh, there's these key drivers and certainly things like efficiency um, and data quality uh, are, are very big ones. Um, as you can see, data quality and human errors are um, above and below each other. Um, and so, so you know from uh, the work that you do with customers, um, one of the things that we identify a lot is the fact that things like custom properties, very basic things like custom property uh, data control is, is not always consistent, is not always clean. That's true. Uh, primarily, there may be a reason that the um, um, customer doesn't know how to configure custom properties. They may not know the best practices, how to populate the fields, which, uh, like you said, like you mentioned, they're going to be resulting in human errors and uh, errors in data quality. With uh, By its turn, then it's going to cause more hours spent on uh, things that we can be doing in a more automated way. Yeah, absolutely. So um, from um, some examples that we've got on the screen, and uh, when I was writing this up, I was um, taking things off because it was getting very long and very big and unwieldy. So I've kind of simplified it. I've kind of structured it to give you some ideas. Um, in the top left, we've got node management. I've got a particular slide on that coming up next. Uh, but things like um, alerting. Um, for those of you um, that use ServiceNow, uh, you're probably well aware that Orion has an integration to ServiceNow already. Um, but that could be any other help desk platform. 
the API could be leveraged to automate alerts into um, different solutions, whether it's a true help desk platform, whether it's an ITSM platform like ServiceNow or Sherwell, uh, Remedy. Um, but and, and since you've heard me say this uh, several times and possibly some of my customers that may be on here, um, alerting is a big one. Uh, and since we use here internally Slack and our alerting system is sending Slack messages to the group chat. Um, so all of the network engineers, all of the systems engineers can look at that and immediately start talking about it. So from that point of view, communication can be improved in alerting. Um, on the right hand side, we've got things like um, application configuration. So utilizing the API to make sure that we have um, a speed of delivery. Um, Antis, can you remember the, the number of groups, um, largest group creation you've done for a customer? I think that was around 900 groups. Oh, you beat me. Mine was about <laughs> 800. So um, we do not like to sit there and create 800 groups manually. So uh, we have a, an internal library of scripts which um, speed up our deployment uh, and configuration work that we do for you customers. And so, yeah, well, one of those is creation of groups and dependencies using a spreadsheet, which takes a lot less of pain and effort away from uh, that task. And uh, at the bottom left, you'll see, and this is one of the examples that we're going to be doing today, is uh, synchronizing data. So utilizing the um, platform to take this um, human issue out of the equation to automate and to make the quality of data that much better. Now, I particularly left this one in as a separate example. Uh, the reason for that is that this is one of those kind of more advanced uh, scenarios. We have customers with tens of thousands of devices. Uh, and we have customers not just with volume, but um, quantity of changes. Um, so maybe devices are being added and decommissioned and changed in the environment on a very regular basis. So for those customers taking uh, the API and using it to um, add devices to Orion, to automate what should be monitored on those devices, i.e. these are the interfaces. I want to monitor CPU and memory. Um, there are custom polars that need to be applied to this. So this is an example of something that's more advanced, means that you can take um, that burden away from your um, team and that when they commission a new device, they have to then go onto Orion or they have to fill in a form that gets submitted to the Orion admin uh, to then make sure that that device is added to Orion and it's monitoring definition is configured. So you can see here we, the a couple of approaches that we've taken. So um, one of them is this kind of comparison uh, method. So um, having a, a method that goes to the um, CMDB or the RTSM platform, grabs down the objects that should be being monitored, compares it to what's managed in Orion, and will throw out some results so you can um, identify, well, it's, that's fine. But uh, again, taking that a step further, actually within service now within Remedy, within all of these other platforms, um, having the ability to say, right, I've added a new object. Here is the definition for it. This is when we purchased it. This is how much we paid for it. This is the service contract. And then if it's been put into a particular state, um, it will automatically create that entity in Orion and immediately begin monitoring it. That as an automated function is um, fantastic uh, for many, many customers. So from a, an API point of view, uh, if you're not familiar with what an API is, uh, uh, Orion has an internal API referred to as the Solowinds Information Service or SWISS, uh, because we like our acronyms in IT, don't we? And so um, we have two interfaces. We have a SOAP XML interface and we have a RESTful JSON interface. Uh, we pretty much do all of our work against the REST, uh, REST JSON. It's the newer is the better uh, performing and, and more functional. And from that point of view, we can use that to communicate and we can use that to perform a number of tasks. So Antonis, um, CRUD, um, a common reference in um, APIs. Do you want to explain what a CRUD API is? Yes, so a CRUD API is an acronym, again, because we love acronyms, for create, read, update, and delete. All of those four verbs are actually referring back to records and is a preferred uh, method, especially in REST APIs, to update records, to create new records, to retrieve information using the read, or just to delete. So this is the way, these are the ways that uh, 
we would do normally to uh, implement any of our scripts and uh, get access to any of the APIs, either SoloWinds or any other platform. Yeah, so um, from that, you can um, use it as you say, read. Um, so extract data out. So that previous example of doing this kind of synchronization, just literally performing a read, doing a comparison, providing some output to identify that maybe some um, objects monitoring is missing. But those create, update and delete functions essentially allow us to automate a huge amount of capability. So the tasks that you perform in the GUI are using this very same interface to do that. When you add a device in the web GUI, um, it is interacting with the same Swiss API interface um, that you can utilize to perform the same function. So this then opens up this whole world of capabilities. Um, on the right hand side uh, with that screenshot, you can see that we've got um, a list of um, the page from the GitHub. Now, actually, this is a, an open repository. This is open source, uh, maintained by SolarWinds, uh, contributed by other users as well. And um, there is a list there of some samples. Now, that sample list is for the PowerShell library. And so this is easily downloadable. You can access it on that URL there. Um, you can download those um, PowerShell scripts. There are ones for Perl. There are ones for um, uh, 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 VB and various other things. Python, yeah, we love Python. Um, so from that point of view, um, you can have a look and see how uh, these are done. Use these as the foundation. Um, uh, I'll provide a URL later on with regards how you can access some uh, forum resources on the THWAC website as well. Now, underneath the API is the SolarWinds query language. Now, the SolarWinds query language is a um, subset. Um, it's based on the uh, standard SQL syntax. And so pretty much all of the co uh, common uh, constructs are available. Um, now, why it's been uh, created is really simplification. Um, the fact that the database for Orion is quite large, um, it has a lot of tables. Um, there are sub tables to separate out and perform um, data storage and structure in a more efficient manner. And so therefore, um, SolarWinds have this SolarWinds query language to provide a mechanism to um, integrate and correlate. Essentially, we're kind of creating SQL views uh, with a lot of this syntax. You can see on the examples that we've got here, and this is a very, very basic one. And let me tell you, when you've got about three or four plus joins on a, a SQL statement, when you convert that to Swickle, um, the simplification becomes apparent very, very um, uh, clearly. So here we've got a basic example of a select statement where we're going into the interfaces table, uh, but then we're doing a join onto the nodes table because we want to get, um, in this example, the contact information for some reason out of that identity. So um, that's a very simplistic SQL statement. But what you can see here is that we've got an equivalent in Swickle that um, has no joins. The join is created by using the object and entity reference. So you can see that I dot node, and we've used um, aliases here because we're, we're nice and we're good and we do things the right way. Um, so we've got this reference here to the nodes table uh, as a structure, and therefore the, the join will be performed for us in the background. So as I say, um, uh, if you've ever done any custom queries, um, any uh, custom reports or such like, um, Swickle is really going to be a nice way um, to, to utilize and to simplify um, how that is put together. We'll have a look later on how we are going to utilize this in a number of areas. One of the big benefits that we have at the bottom there is the fact that we can put inbuilt pagination. So we can add a line after the order by statement uh, where we're saying, actually, I want to start at row 50 and show me the next 50. So this is going to allow you to create um, a better structure. So maybe you've got multiple um, data values that you want to work through. Uh, pagination is very much going to help with that. Be aware that select star is not supported. Everything has to be um, hard defined. So we're going to look at moving very swiftly now into the live demo. So what we're going to show in the demo today is how we can utilize ServiceNow to put an object into an unmanaged state. Now, from your point of view, you may have situations where you have maintenance windows. And when you have those maintenance windows, devices may go down, be rebooted, um, come off the network, and therefore Orion will generate a, a node down alert, for example. 
you don't want that to happen. Um, so we have a way of controlling this. Um, this could be used for um, moving a device into development state where we want to mute alerts rather than um, stopping uh, monitoring completely. We just don't need to be alerted because it's a dev device. The engineer doesn't want to get woken up at three o'clock in the morning to go and fix it because it's in development. It's not a production platform. So this uh, will see how we can use the ServiceNow interface, not even touch Orion, um, and we can put the objects into an unmanaged condition. And the second demonstration that Antonis will take you through is uh, the fact that we have a, a script which is doing data synchronization tasks. Uh, it could be one way. We could be synchronizing data from ServiceNow into Orion. We could be doing it from ServiceNow, um, um, uh, sorry, Orion back to ServiceNow. Uh, the demonstration we're going to do today is going to do bi-directional synchronization. Now this, as we will see, is uh, based on keeping custom property data up to date, keeping it accurate. Um, and typically a customer will be creating this as a scheduled entity. So Anton, so I'm going to pass over presentation to you. Yep. Let me share my screen. So, so hopefully... Far. While Anton is just setting up on that, um, please ask questions. We have a question panel on the um, GoToWebinar uh, interface. Uh, please put forward any questions that you have. Uh, so they will uh, maybe answering them as we go through certain sections, uh, but we'll certainly be taking them towards the end. So please utilize that. Right, okay. Did I share the right screen? Are we in the service now? Uh, we are indeed, yeah. Yep. Well, indeed, yeah. Okay, so let's start with a few basics uh, over here. So here's our uh, managed nodes in Orion. This is our dev platform, so uh, we don't have a huge number of devices and not everything is uh, genuine or a device indeed. Some of us is just dummy data. Uh, but I do know that this is an ESXi server, so we can actually just go quickly and have a look that and see that we get the regular node details page. This is a uh, managed node. We have some response time. We don't have any packet loss, oh, but again, we do have some critical uh, status on the hardware status. So I'm just gonna go hit the back now uh, button, go back to service now, and take a look that the ESX host is actually reflected over here. So what I'm gonna do now is going to the uh, details page on the ServiceNow platform. This is an ITSM platform, so we have various uh, details here. Uh, we get uh, things like device role, we get the state, we get uh, the assignment, and all of the other things that you would expect on the uh, ServiceNow platform to be populated over here. So, yep. Anthony, these, this is just the kind of framework. We're using ServiceNow because we have the ability to um, access that. It's the most common platform. But um, what we're going to be showing today is relevant across um, any kind of CMDB or application that's managing objects. Is that right? Yes, that is right. We just, uh, I think we just pick it out of the random. It is a kind of popular thing, but you just pick it out. So, uh, on this case, we're going to be doing it, uh, we're going to be getting, uh, uh, we're going to be changing the status of the device from managed to unmanaged. Now, we're just going to be doing this only for one device, but in a more real case scenario, that would be for a bunch of devices. It could be under uh, scheduled maintenance windows. Just for simplicity, we're just going to be doing this for our, our ESX host. So, uh, without any further delay, I'm just going to go here and have it in maintenance mode. I'm gonna click the update button. This will trigger a business rule uh, in the back end. So going here back to the managed nodes details page, uh, the managed nodes page, I am expecting to see the ESX host being on unmanaged. And there it is. We have grouped them by the unmanaged window. So the ESX host has grown unmanaged from, well, right now uh, for the next 100 days. So, uh, obviously, in terms of um, how this is working, that it was instant. Yeah, there was no delay. There was no um, issues with timings. It was literally as soon as you pressed update, that went away and yes. made that function. Okay. There are, there are various of methods here. So, um, ServiceNow also supports different methods. So, it could also be as fast as just changing the field without even having to press the update button. So, it would be a kind of an uh, asynchronous operation. 
So now you may also ask why we put this um, on a 100 days of maintenance. So we just me uh, this is because we want to ensure that this is not con going to come back under active management unless we ask it to be changed in back to state. So let's yeah, go so back. No, so you, you mentioned sorry to interrupt you there. Since you mentioned before that we're doing this as a kind of manual. Um, thing. So you, somebody's coming in and individually on a device is putting into a maintenance state. Um, but we often are going to work with a customer to, to use both, to use that kind of schedule window as well as this, put both of those in place. Is that correct? Yes. So a more proper uh, real world scenario would have uh, here more uh, two drop downs or two text boxes like the ones on the bottom right, which would um, define the start date and the end date of the unmanaged window. It could be also an automated task through the schedule uh, maintenance uh, native function of ServiceNow. So imagine that you have some passing schedule that you wish to apply on your window service, um, different techniques, different passing windows, different grouping perhaps. In that case, you would just hit one button in ServiceNow and that would take a whole bunch of uh, window servers and managed for the next four hours or when, uh, what the maintenance window is actually defined of this uh, on the service now. Yeah, and I know we also use this for situations where uh, uh, devices are being um, decommissioned and often what is required for a customer is that they want to keep the data in Orion because maybe the, uh, the historic data is of value, maybe they need to do the uh, reporting cycle uh, before they delete the object from the um, platform. Uh, so again, the kind of application can have the logic to say, well, when we put it in decommissioned, it puts it into a um, move it into the next 50 years, so it can't then come back onto active monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Okay. So what we're going to do now is, well, let's just assume that the uh, maintenance is over for this device, so we're going to put it back in in-use state. Now, as soon as I hit the update button, another business rule will run on the background in service now. So hitting the button now, which will trigger a script. With using the REST API of Orion and putting it back to a managed state. Now, within Orion, there's a good chance that the device will come back with a gray icon, and this is because Orion will actually um, reset the, the previous states on the uh, details table that is keeping the historic data, so it actually needs to complete another polling cycle to get the most frequent um, uh, stats of that device. So I'm just going to initiate a poll now function. This may take a few seconds because the polling uh, needs to go through the uh, polling bucket. <laughs> so, so, so. Don't get too technical there, Antonis, please. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully after one or two refresh, there it is. So up again. Well, still in a critical state that hasn't changed properly, those guys didn't do a good maintenance. Okay, so that's excellent. So literally to take start um, through that process again, we've created within the ServiceNow interface that um, utilize that state dropdown, change the value into in maintenance, it could be any of the other ones, and that has interacted with Orion to, to put the device into an unmanaged state, and now again, bring it back out again. Yep. Perfect. Okay, should we head to the next demo? Let's let's move on. Um, we do have a, a question here, um, so let's answer that now, just while you're you're setting up. So um, uh, Gary's asked, um, are you aware of Solwin's working with Assist? Um, this is uh, uh, the the more generic answer to this is as long as the platform that you're referring to, in this case Assist, uh, what we're showing here, ServiceNow, as long as that has the ability. So Antonis, can you just um, do something for me? Can you just go back to ServiceNow? Mm -hmm and just show the fact that we have um, this REST API uh, area. So um, ServiceNow um, just has this REST API capability. So as long as Assist, which I know it does, um, has the ability to support that. Um, so this is one of the components that makes this work. And so here is the definition of how we interact. So you can see at the top there, we've got the um, endpoint URI. Uh, the fact that we're going to be passing a script uh, or a, a call into that, um, as long as the platform supports this function, 
then yes, it can be supported. If it, even if it can't do this and it can just execute a script, then the script, as long as uh, we can interact with an API as a web service, um, yes, it can be supported. We have yet to find something that we've had to turn around and say, no, we can't do that. Thank it's you. Actually, a good sorry. challenge. <laughs> yes. No problem. Right. Uh, so if there are no any other questions at this point, uh, let's move on to our uh, sync demo. So again, uh, just a bit of a background over here. Um, I'm guessing that most of you are already familiar with custom properties, uh, being users of Orion. So there are going to be a few custom properties that uh, will be required by your users to be filled out from a form or from ServiceNow or from a CMDB uh, platform. Again, this is probably a good driving force why you should be leveraging um, sync capabilities or uh, the API in Orion. Uh, things like asset tag or device type, um, a network operator may not be sure, or uh, uh, let's get it uh, put it together, a solo wins operator may not be a, aware or sure what this one is because he's just an old guy and he needs to know whether an alert has been triggered or not. But still he, he needs to know if uh, the asset tag of the device, so you can probably notify the right people or the device type or anything else that's part of the CMD pop, CMDB population, which is over here. Let's just open our VM host server. So in Orion, we probably will need to populate things like the asset tag, the device role, the operational owner or assigned to, uh, maybe class, uh, definitely location, um, serial number, no, uh, department or company if that's a multi-client platform. Now, on the other hand, there are going to be a lot of properties that Orion is able to populate but uh, operators in ServiceNow on the CMDB have absolutely no idea how to get them in there. So um, going to the actual Orion demo of SolarWinds, this is a uh, good report from uh, driven directly from NCM, which is a good uh, indicator of what we can actually retrieve from a network device. So we get, get things like the card seal number. We can get, well, obviously manufacturer and module are going to be probably natively uh, supported. Um, system description, machine type, last boot, iOS version, all of these things, we can have them as a dual sync function from Orion back to ServiceNow. So, Ansys, actually, can you do me a favor? Can you go back to your ESX host details page? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the left-hand side, go to the asset inventory. So uh, you just showed there an example of network configuration information where you had software and firmware versions and serial numbers. Um, for those users that got um, uh, NPM and SAM, um, what you see on this screen is a, a useful thing. So this is actually configuration information. This is hardware information on how that device is resourced. This is a, a physical server. Um, Yes, uh, it's the host I've just noticed. And so from that, you can see that we're collecting serial numbers of, of disks, of um, how many processes and what versions they are. Um, so all of this information as well can get pushed up as well. Is that right? That's right. So you can even uh, go as granular as getting the actual model, model of the uh, memory modules and put them back in service now. Create the relevant CIs in there and just tie them back to the host level in case you get a memory failure and you need to get it back. Yeah. So today, is it right you're going to be pushing across that service tag value in the middle left? Yes. So today uh, on our demo, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to get the service tag value back to the ServiceNow platform. So it's going to be populated under this field. And from ServiceNow, we're going to be getting information from device role and asset tag populated back to uh, Orion. Okay. So let's go back to our uh, actual script. We're going to be leveraging PowerShell for this one. Um, this is just uh, my preference. Again, you could be using any kind of uh, programming language or scripting language that is capable of um, leveraging uh, REST uh, JSON request or SOAP XML. 
any of those. Uh, from my point of view, often it, it makes more sense to use PowerShell being native to Windows and SolarWinds is uh, based on a Windows platform. So, so one uh, of the first things I see on, on that, and this is um, the, the first line is that we're loading a snap in. So um, this is um, doing what for us? Right, so this is actually a PowerShell snap in that has been compiled from SolarWinds and it it allows us to use um, the CRUD operations with another couple of uh, other verbs um, without needing to go back to using uh, REST, uh, the REST API. So it's going to be using the REST API on our behalf. And it makes things easier because it's pre-compiled. So we can be doing, uh, we could be executing um, queries, SQL queries with um, uh, using the Swiss snapping instead of just getting the regular HTTP request that we're leveraging for the service now, as we'll see in a second. All right, so uh, we won't be going through the entire details of the code. Uh, as a high level overview, we will start by connecting to ServiceNow and to retrieve the record details. So if you're familiar with this one, you'll probably notice that this is a uh, REST request <clears throat> uh, using HTTP method. Then we're going to be storing some values to local variables. So just uh, on that um, statement on the REST request, so we are going to need to have an understanding of um, how this third party application itself works. So we are using, unlike the first example where it was done in the GUI, uh, we're actually using the API of ServiceNow here. It could be, uh, as Gary has assist, it could be um, uh, Remedy. Uh, so we have to have a little bit of understanding. So this is where we often work with uh, customers um, and their engineers that are responsible for ServiceNow, for example, um, to make the solution uh, work properly because they're going to have good, uh, knowledge on that side. We've obviously got the knowledge on the Orion side uh, and the two come together to, to come together with the solution. Mm -hmm. um, right. So next step would be to connect back to Orion. Uh, you notice that we have a try catch block over here just to demonstrate that we can also have capabilities and we should be doing some safe programming. Comments and test and um, catching as well, and error checking, like it, thank you. Yes, error checking and definitely comments. Maybe the most, well, not the most, but one of the most boring things, definitely, but also most uh, the most crucial thing when it comes to all scripting. Now, um, testing common activity to the Orion server, just performing a very simple query to see if we're actually connected. We're going to retrieve the custom property um, uh, and the service tag information straight from Orion. And then the real work on five and six, we're going to be updating the asset tag in Orion, and then we're going to be updating the service tag in ServiceNow. Apologies, asset tag and device type in Orion, and just the service tag in service now. So what I'm seeing on lines 72 and 73 is the kind of read pullout. We're extracting the data from Orion to then utilize as we push that data up to uh, service now. Is that right? Uh, yeah, then that, that's actually a good observation, Mark, because we're not actually using one of the CRUD operations here. So the CRUD operations are more relevant for having endpoints. Uh, this is one of the verbs that come with the Swiss uh, PowerShell snapping, the get Swiss data. It actually allows us to execute the actual queries with some parameters if needed, which is probably the most easy, uh, easiest way of getting data from Orion. Yep, so we've got that get request and then on 77 we've got a set, so now is going to push data into. Yes. Exactly. So this is one of the uh, verbs outside the CRUD operations. This is the update operation, the set Swiss object. Okay, so let's uh, head back to ServiceNow and our Orion installation. So just we can clearly see that there is nothing populated under asset tag and device type. Going to ServiceNow, there is nothing of the service tag or the ESX host. Pray everybody, please. Yeah. <laughs> now, we have, I have uh, done this script only for one node. 
Here's the hard-coded node ID equals 18. I know it beforehand. Uh, regularly, you would do this for a bunch of nodes. There would be loops within. There would be more error checking. There would be more logic to check a few things. But just to keep things simple, on this demonstration, we just had one. All right. So let's execute the script. See a few things flashing. Nothing popped out. I didn't have anything on the output, so we should be having. Oh, there it is. So, because this is using AJAX on service now, we can see that this has been modified by a system administrator and it's being populated with a service tag. So, if we go... that's because you've used the system administrator user account to connect to the API? Uh, yes. This is. Okay, uh, so that, yeah. that's going to give you that user um, visibility and also be in the audit trail as well, I guess. Exactly. It would be under the audit trail. Now, if we go back to our asset inventory, we'll see that this is an exact patch. That's uh, data quality again. And under our managed nodes entity, I'm just going to refresh the page and make sure that our ESX host gets the right data on asset tag and device type. There we go. This is a VM host server with the correct asset tag. Excellent. So just to reiterate, you just in terms of this demo, we've done this for one device, but the script or the code that we put together, this could be one device, it could be 10,000 devices, it could be 100,000 devices. It, it really comes down to the requirements, yes? Exactly. So depending on the requirements, uh, we can expect to see very different logic on the script itself. So obviously, when, you ha when you're updating a few records at a time, a few records uh, per hour, you don't maybe you don't care about efficiency and you care about code readability but if you're updating a few thousands on its script execution you also need to take care of things, for things like uh, make make the api calls efficient make sure that you're not hammering the database or any uh, any other aspects of the system systems of performance okay fantastic thank you very much for that so um, just to recap uh, we've got uh, the second example here of synchronization and that script would have been extended and written uh, fully to loop through maybe have some filters on, on uh, what it's updating and uh, we're probably then creating a scheduled entity or maybe tying that into a trigger function that will automatically um, keep that up to date so um, this is really really useful I, I Anyone that's worked with me um, on an installation uh, or consultancy of their Orion platform will know me witter on about the importance of custom properties. Um, they are the foundation of any successful and useful um, uh, platform of Orion. They underpin so many different areas from alerting to web presentation to user access control to reports. And so getting them right and getting them consistent. So for example, here, if we had a, an alert that said, um, uh, all VM host server alerts need to go to the VM admin um, Slack channel or to the this group of uh, VM admins, um, but that value wasn't defined in the custom property and that device went down or there was a problem with it, the alerts wouldn't receive, uh, be received by those people. So we need to uh, say make sure that we have that quality data uh, available to us. Okay, fantastic, Anthony. Um, I know we have time. Are you able to just show the um, uh, Swickle Studio application to um, to everyone here? Just give it a little bit of an, uh, an overview. So this is installed as part of the SDK. Um, it can be installed on any um, uh, Windows server, and you can, if you can, just kind of highlight how it can be used to perform a kind of a query. Um, that it has actually some operational things as well in there, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is a very good uh, opportunity to demonstrate the Swickle Studio because there was a major uh, update on this uh, application uh, the last few weeks, which made it uh, a lot better. And uh, it's uh, actually uh, fantastic, I, I may say, uh, at this stage. So what we're seeing here is uh, kind of the equivalent of uh, what you have already probably been experienced with the database manager or Microsoft SQL Studio, uh, but this is using uh, SQL, uh, not SQL. So uh, a lot of things are already being grouped depending on which object you're targeting. If you were want to, if you wanted to do some uh, queries or API scripts on F5, you would probably need to go to orionf 5gtm and expand uh, a few 
uh, I'm going to say tables here, but these are not actual tables. These are referred as entities uh, in uh, Swiku in Orion. So let's go back and actually have a look on the Orion, entity, Orion class, which has the most entities of all. So drilling down to our regular nodes entities, we'll see that uh, they're, they're going to be a, a few things over here. Uh, works the same as database manager. So if we right click on the nodes, we can see there is a generate select statement or with inherited properties. Properties. We're going to come back on this one in a sec. Top 1000 with all the fields or entity uh, or columns displayed. So hitting the execute will just populate everything that we have on our uh, node entities. Now. All of those objects on the left are going to have, some of those are going to have a blue icon, some of those are going to have a green one, and others are going to have a chain. The ones with the blue icon are actually the um, properties that belong to that entity. So the status, the status left, the system object ID, these are properties that belong to the node entities. The ones in green are inherited properties and everything with a chain is a navigational property. Now, a navigational property actually defines uh, a shortcut to a join. This can be either a simple uh, foreign key join or a join through a mapping table for a many-to-many -many relationship, but this is how we can actually cross-reference um, columns from different tables without going through multiple joins. So I have here one example that we can uh, use. So let's just say that we want to get um, the node on uh, the first column, the IP address, and every interface that this node has. We would probably use uh, select the nodes caption, the IP address, and the interface's name as interface name using alias again from the nodes entity left join with the interfaces. Now, we don't need to do that because on the node entities, we can actually see that there is a direct link to the interfaces. So we can actually reference the interfaces table or entity in Swaco uh, straight from nodes. So on the other tab, query number two, I have the same query without using uh, any joints. So execute this one, we got the same result set. Excellent. So um, from there, you um, have got those kind of um, uh, icons on the left hand side. They are the linked tables. So um, when you're in and as you are here in the nodes, there's actually a lot there because of clearly uh, the node is very much a central object to Orion. Uh, some of the other ones are going to have less, more. Um, so um, that is going to give you the ability to identify how those um, joins can be referenced. And obviously in terms of in the brackets, the object name that you're going to be calling in. Yes, exactly. Fantastic. Um, are you able just to go down and show the ver yeah the, the verbs? So uh, we have a question from Adam about um, uh, the structure of um, how we pass um, that call into the API. So if you just kind of very quickly show us it, the, in the studio, mm -hmm. yeah, you so. Uh, if so, yeah, the items on the ping are all the, the different verbs that we can use uh, for its entity. So uh, this is actually the two verbs that we used within uh, the uh, service now uh, automation. First, we use the unmanaged verb, then we just use the remanaged verb to um, um, change the status of the node. If you right-click on the unmanaged, you can use the invoke, which is going to start another. Uh, <clears throat> pop up to uh, make sure uh, to uh, invoke the verb. Net object ID, ID obviously that is going to be the uh, node ID. Unmanaged time, this is from time. Remanaged time, this is to time. The is relative. Um, to be honest with you, I don't remember what this one is. False. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah, it's just false. This is false, uh, but there is a good reference on the actual. Uh, or an SDK GitHub because there is an entire wiki schema over there. 
And so that's the, the GUI, and you're now going to show um, a lovely thing that's going to speed up the ability for the code to be generated. Um, yep. So if you wanted to get the code generated um, for this query, was it, Mark? Yep. 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 If you go use that as an example. Yep. So we can use the copy query as, and it's going to generate either a curl command or on the sorry a curl on Windows or Linux or on the get Swiss data this is the verb that we previously used for PowerShell. So I'm just gonna click this one it copied it on my clipboard. Let's get just a new window open and there it is. It also exposed my very complex password over here. <laughs> oh no I have to change that now. Um, but what you can see there, that is very much the similar um, uh, structure that we had in your script. Um, so that, as I say, can very much help people um, get this together. Can you also just go back to the ServiceNow interface and go to the um, REST message? Yeah, uh, the top. And so what, uh, and if we just kind of show you um, the structure of this as we go into. Uh, in this example, as I say, so go click on uh, yeah, unmanage would work nicely, and HTTP request. So you can see that endpoint. So that's the URI, the one that we're um, making the connection to on the JSON interface. And you can see at the bottom we've got some uh, query parameters. So this is a post, and therefore we are posting a body. Uh, so it's the JSON body, and we're passing, in this case, a node ID. It's a variable uh, because we, uh, the script is inserting the right value further down the line. Uh, but yeah, that hopefully, um, Adam is able to answer your question in the fact that we are um, making a call to a URI, and we're posting, in this case, a body which mm -hmm. will perform the action. So we've got a, a start date, end date, the node ID, and we've got the uh, entity set to false. Yeah, so just a note over here, all of those three objects are actually uh, variables uh, taken from the service style fields. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're, we, in the script um, uh, we have, um, I don't think we need to show you that, but if somebody does want to see that, then let us know, we can bring it up on the screen. Um, but yeah, the script is just then replacing those values with the object that we are actually running the update command on. Okay, and since we have a few questions, is now a good time to, to go through some of those? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if I just start off, um, um, so we've got a question from Clive. I'm guessing you could run the script on a trigger in the CMDB, such as add device. So I think this was in this came in when you were doing the synchronization. So yes, this is absolutely feasible, and it's probably the, the, the preferred method. But again, it also depends on the business logic. So you may add actually a device, but um, you may want to be triggered after you update at least some fields. So you can probably introduce further logic to ServiceNow so to uh, sync back to Orion. Yeah, so um, ServiceNow has this, uh, again, I'm referring to ServiceNow, please accept that this is likely in many other platforms as well. Um, so really this comes down to the workflow of how things work. Um, for example, if you've already added the device to Orion, and then you add the device to service now, then absolutely when you click on add, um, go through the process of adding the device, that could automatically push the custom properties in and up um, uh, in the integration that you've seen. Uh, but the more likely situation is that service now will have the object first before it hits Orion. So maybe as I say, this is where we were going through the node management function where service now is adding that node to Orion. It's adding the fact that here's a node on this IP address and I want to monitor CPU, I want to collect asset inventory, I want to collect the VLAN data, um, I want to apply a custom polar and I want to populate the custom property values as part of that process. So a bit more advanced but absolutely capable and something that we've worked with on uh, for several customers. Um, let me have a look at this. So. Uh, we've got an, a question from Russ. Hi, um, could the maintenance window functionally work by linking to a change request window? And could this work also with um, WPM? Uh, yes, um, knowing what nodes transactions should be blanked out from a service name. So in general, the, the question there is, we've shown you this in NPM, but this could be putting a SAM 
application into an unmanaged state. It could be um, disabling and putting into a managed state the WPM, the Web Performance Monitor um, interface. This is part of a CI method, but if you're using the change request functionality in a solution, then absolutely um, the same kind of things can be achieved. All we are doing is leveraging the capabilities of the application to execute a script which calls into the API to perform activities against the Orion API. Um, so from that point of view, yes, that can be achieved, Ross. Um, I have another question. So I'm not sure Adam has asked, how about SolarWinds to service now? Um, uh, Adam, if you want to put into the um, question window um, a bit more information, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, another question, can you show the asset tag going back the other way from CMDB to service now, uh, to SolarWinds? Uh, so, Antis, if you can just go back to the asset screen for me. Yes. So. So just to confirm, what we did in this demonstration today is we chose a number of fields which um, are going to go um, are going to be stored in ServiceNow. Yeah. So when you create a ServiceNow object, it inherently will be given an asset tag. That is not something that Orion will know about immediately. Um, however, Orion, when you add a node, is going to know what the service tag is on the device. It's going to know what the um, uh, device. Uh, sorry, the um, serial number, the firmware version, the software version. Um, it's going to know that it's got um, three DIMM slots, oh, not three DIMM slots, four DIMM <laughs> slots filled in with two CPUs. It's really a case of what is the authoritative data source? Is that going to be data created and stored in service now? Or is that data that Orion is collecting as part of its monitoring function? That then really determines which one pushes data up and which one pushes data down. So hopefully, Gary, that answers your question. Um, in essence, yes, you have control over which direction you push data to. It's really about where that data exists, where it is authoritative, and the structure that you can create around it. Um, so Adam, uh, is there any guidance on how to set the SolarWinds seem to be update process, not the update code? Um, yeah, so I, and I'll take that question offline a little bit more involved, uh, but essentially the question is kind of a bit more about how this uh, comes together um, in both of those platforms. Um, so yeah, we can have a discussion separately. Um, another question, at present we have to add asset info via contact info on the device configuration. Um, contact information. So. Gary, I think you're are you referring to the fact that you're manually creating or populating uh, the custom property values within Orion. I think so. Um, nothing automatic yet. So this is all about um, uh, saving you that issue of putting data in twice, of having to put it into your ITSM platform and then manually do that within Orion. This is all about making sure that that is automatically done and making sure that actually there's one data source which is the correct and true one that means that fat finger syndrome the fact that it doesn't get forgotten and lost um uh, and since one of the reports that you wrote um uh, a long long time ago was the fact that we provide reports to customers that identify missing custom properties and so people can identify that they should be going in and making sure that device role has been filled in that the site has been filled in that the um, other information is there okay okay so um I think we've got time for one more question here. Uh, is there a way to use the API to manage Exchange servers and automate rebooting them in a specific order after updating them? Okay, that's an interesting one. Antis, do you want to handle that? Um, yeah, so there is definitely a way to use um, uh, API um, using the web services in the Exchange servers. That would probably be very cautious about the logic when it comes to automatic reporting the, uh, uh, those servers. Yeah, so um, the thing with this is I wish um, talking about the API 
in Orion. So we are interacting with Orion. Uh, what you're referring to there, Eugene, is the fact that you're communicating with the Exchange server and you're rebooting it. So uh, we have uh, um, one customer created or extended the information that you see on the screen um, in Orion. Um, so we can kind of put that kind of information that we'll then um, execute on a schedule. But in all honesty, this is a monitoring platform. Uh, what you're referring to there is the patch management uh, kind of solution probably, uh, which is a separate solution from uh, SolarWinds. Uh, and so uh, I suggest that you look at that method rather than the Orion API. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Antis. I'm just going to take my control back. So just to wrap up the session today, um, uh, so um, the professional services that we provide here, uh, we work with customers um, a lot in terms of their installations, uh, making sure that they can take maximum benefit. Today, obviously, we've been talking about the API. And so if you need advice, if you need help on the kind of things that can be achieved, um, we are more than happy to speak to you on those capabilities. Uh, but as you can see, we provide many other services to our customers, uh, as say, around making sure they get maximum benefit from the platform. So. There's a little bit of information. Um, you can see that there is a link at the top there to our blog. Um, a lot of what we do in terms of these webinars are based on, uh, based on our blog posts. So um, that is a very good resource. Uh, we put them up on a regular basis, um, tips and tricks. Uh, we have things that are there to um, uh, bring things to your attention on improving the platform, on new features. Um, there is a new version of each of the applications released last week for NPM SAM. Uh, NetFlow, so keep an eye on some blog posts we'll be putting up on those subjects. Uh, so to confirm, I'm Mark Roberts, Antonis, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mark. And on the last screen here, we've just got some uh, further links uh, to help you in uh, your quest on utilizing the API. If you do have any questions, please reach out to your account manager. Please um, contact us. Uh, be more than happy to uh, help in any way we can. So hopefully you found today very useful. And again, thank you very much. Bye-bye now.